Let's Talk Deathwing, Ravenwing, Lionel Johnson and the Forces of the Unforgiven with a review of Codex Dark Angels 440k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Dark Angels and in this video I thought we'd talk through the entire match play contents of the book. The book first being available in the Deathwing Assault box set before following on to go on individual sale. The Force of the Dark Angels in 10th edition have kind of been a sort of mid-tier army up to now. Currently I'd say that just a couple of their units really stand out, maybe things like Azrael and the Deathwing Knights. Hopefully after the dust has settled between these rules changes and points cuts that I'm hoping that they'll get, a few more units might show their strength in competitive Space Marine armies again. Initial reception to the book, I must admit, has been fairly bad. Perhaps the biggest things of interest that have been added to the book are the new unit in the Inner Circle Companions and the new Deathwing and Ravenwing detachments, both of which do have interesting things going on. But beyond that, a fair few other things do seem to have got worse in one way or another, several units slightly toned down, and plenty of underwhelming things, whether they're units or the Unforgiven detachment. They don't really seem to have made any improvements to those or tried to make them more interesting. It's not to say that the army couldn't wind up being very powerful though, until we get the final points cost which will come with the digital download, we won't actually know that. If they did stay sort of similar though, then it's unlikely to be the case. First up though, let's talk through the content of Codex Dark Angels. As with all the 40k codexes, it's got plenty of other things. Lore and miniature galleries, crusade content and combat patrol rules. For this review though, I'm going to be focusing on the match play rules. The core thing is to run a Dark Angels army in games of 40k. In the core rules for this one, there's a reference to Oath of Moment, just denoting it as the mainline Space Marine rule that you get with the faction. Rules for how more generic Space Marine data sheets acquire either the Ravenwing or Deathwing keywords. Three different attachments, the Unforgiven, the Ravenwing and the Deathwing one. Far less than most codexes that we've had so far, but this one is more sort of small codex supplement as opposed to an entire big book codex in its own right. 16 data sheets with a few less than there were previously. Strike Masters, Talon Masters and the Deathwing Command Squad have all gone, though there's a new one in the Inner Circle Companions. There are printed points costs in the book, though they'll be immediately out of date given that Games Workshop's official ones come from the digital download on the Munitor and Field Manual. And as mentioned, we won't know the final points costs until that comes we can certainly get to grips with all the rules interactions in the codex and broadly where the unit's points would need to be for them to be good. Otherwise the Dark Angels can of course use other content from Codex Space Marines, they get the Oath of Moment core rule from that, plus any of their generic data sheets and their generic detachments such as the Gladius and Ironstorm. It does mean that Dark Angels will have the access to the most attachments out of any army in 40k right now, 10 of them in total between these and the Codex Space Marine ones. Let's jump straight in though, and as per the rest of Space Marines, their core rule is the Oath of Moment. This is the one where you get to nominate one enemy unit in your command phase, and until the start of the next one you get to re-roll or hit rolls against that target, giving you a big damage boost. Usually if you're hitting on a 3+, plus, it equates to a 33% damage increase. Occasionally if you're hitting on a 2+, plus and you had good sustained or lethal hits going on, then it might make sense to fish for those and re-roll everything else. In general it's maybe not quite as impactful as it was when you could re-roll the wound roll as well. This is definitely a solid damage boost for Space Marine armies and tends to be most effective against really big focal enemy units that you could perhaps focus a whole bunch of guns on. Otherwise, for an additional core rule for the Dark Angels, interestingly enough we get their rules for getting the Deathwing and Ravenwing units. I thought that these might be locked to their own individual detachments, but it just seems that any army of Dark Angels applies the keywords to other units in Codex Space Marines. These only really tend to be relevant within those specific detachments though, so the Ravenwing Company of Heroes and the Deathwing Inner Circle Task Force, as they determine which units can function with certain stratagems and enhancements. The Ravenwing keyword gets gained by mounted units such as Outriders, ATVs and the Bike Chaplain and also any vehicles that can fly, so that would be the Storm Speeders as expected but also all Space Marine Flyers as well, things like Storm Ravens, Storm Hawks and Storm Talons. I guess in theory the Mighty Thunderhawk would also be Ravenwing as well. Deathwing on the other hand is gained by all Terminator keyworded units, that's really not a surprise there, but otherwise it looks like literally all veteran style units get it, Blade Guard and the Blade Guard Ancient, Stern Guard and Vanguard veterans, which aren't something that Dark Angels tended to be as much associated with, and also Land Raiders, Repulsors and Dreadnoughts, typical things that might often bolster the first company. Otherwise, within the Codex itself, several of the characters get Ravenwing or Deathwing. Samuel and all the things that you would expect gain Ravenwing. Deathwing is even more liberally handed out though. The new Inner Circle Companions get that, 
plus all Codex generic characters aside from Samael and the Lion. That's kind of interesting in that you could give the Deathwing keywords to other units that they're leading. Say for example having Ezekiel or Asmodai in a more green wing unit. Perhaps some of the biggest interests for the new book are the two new detachments though. It did seem likely that there'd be one for Ravenwing and Deathwing when the Codex came out. And that's exactly what Games Workshop gave us. In general for these detachments none of them lock out any models at all. So you could still field any army in any of them. It just depends on what sort of support you might get for that army. The buffs within the detachments tend to affect all. For the new Ravenwing and Deathwing ones, the stratagems and enhancements are basically entirely focused on their themed units, and as per standard, all of them get 4 enhancements, 6 stratagems, and all of them get Armour of Contempt as one of those stratagems. The three detachments that we've got are the Green Wing Unforgiving Task Force, perhaps the more balanced Dark Angels one. The Inner Circle Task Force is the more Deathwing themed one, Terminators, but I guess also equally veterans now it would seem. And the Company of Hunters is the Ravenwing themed one. Lots of stratagems for fast moving bikes and speeders. Starting out let's take a look at the new ones first. And let's start out with the Ravenwing and the Company of Hunters. The core rule for this one is that all units can advance and shoot and fall back and shoot. And that one's not just locked to Ravenwing units so it affects anything else out there. It means that kind of like the Firestorm Task Force it means that you'd have some pretty fast moving firepower. Things like gunline dreadnoughts or tanks will make good use of that as well. And it could be pretty nasty for other things that have short range like space marine eradicators. Could be nice to get their melter weapons to bear and protect them against getting locked up. For the actual Ravenwing units I guess it's certainly not nothing. It means that you might be able to get those plasma talons and range of things just that little bit easier. And there is one enhancement for advance and charge. There might be some element of diminishing returns though in that if you've already got really fast movement and getting just a little bit more of it might not actually help as much. It could be quite nice for if you have small squads locked in combat as well you might be able to fall back and hit them with rapid fire plasma fire. Or in that back and shooting or even nice enough for things like big dreadnoughts that get tagged in combat just being able to happily waltz out of combat and then fire heavy guns at the enemy that you left behind that does seem rather nice. Overall I'd say it's a kind of mid power sort of rule. Definitely handy enough to have, but maybe not quite exciting enough to just be worth it only on its own. The other core rule for the company of hunters is to give you battle line outriders. This is kind of a nice enough fluffy choice to mean that you can take a pretty maximal biker army if you want to. You could have literally 36 outriders on the board if you wanted with this. Though currently at their current points cost, that's not really the most exciting thing in the world. I feel like they're one of the units in Codex Space Marines that definitely needs a points cut right now. Being locked to having all their standard attacks with strength 4 and AP minus 1 doesn't really help them too much. Currently if they do remain like 95 points as they are at the moment, being able to run massive amounts of them isn't really an advantage as competitive lists typically aren't taking any. Though I feel like at least in this detachment they are quite well supported and there's interesting Ravenwing options like the command squad that can join them that we'll get onto. Otherwise for stratagems you get the standard armour of contempt, handy enough to worsen AP by 1. A standard and reliable space marine durability boost might be a little bit less relevant on Ravenwing than some given that they get their 5 plus invulnerable save but still can be good against certain firepower or melee attacks. The next one is Death on the Wind which I'd say is perhaps the weakest stratagem in the detachment. It's a battle shock test for a unit that was just shot by a Ravenwing unit with a further minus 1 to that test if there's a Ravenwing unit within 6 inches. With Battleshock, with the current rules that it has at the moment, that's just not that great. Kind of limited value to Battleshock in your own turn versus the enemy's command phase. And it's not even like you guarantee a failed test with this one, it's a bit of a coin flip. I guess in theory could be a niche option to prevent a super powerful stratagem. Though even then I feel like investing 1 CP yourself for an unreliable chance of that is kind of not a good idea. Next up for 1 CP we've got High Speed Focus. This is minus 1 to hit for a Ravenwing unit. Perhaps a kind of standard expected one for mobility sort of armies. It does only work in the shooting phase, not in the fight phase, so is a little bit more limited than Armour of Contempt there. But I guess it's another option that you could weigh up against Armour of Contempt, if it happened to make more sense if you were being shot by something with low ballistic skill perhaps. In any case I think it's usable enough. Talon Strike is 1 CP, and this one targets a Ravenwing mounted unit in the shooting or the fight phase. And this one gives you a plus one to the wound roll against infantry or mounted units with the character keyword. I guess particularly nice if you're wounding on a four plus or five plus to start with. Though you can't use it to target characters that are monsters or vehicles as it would have been quite nice against Imperial Knights. Being locked to anti-character is sort of situational but I suppose a nice enough one when it does trigger. 
Next up for 1CP, there's Rapid Reappraisal. This one is one of those options that allows a Ravenwing unit not in engagement range to return to strategic reserve, and it triggers at the end of the enemy fight phase. This one's quite a common one throughout Warhammer 40k, though I do kind of feel in a Ravenwing mobility focused army it might be a little bit less good than some of the rest. Ravenwing units when they're on the board can go really quite a big distance, particularly and still shoot with the detachment rule for this, and that might be more use than just having them turn up again somewhere just outside of 9 inches of enemy squads. Still could be fairly spooky though I guess, the threats to move a big Ravenwing unit from your side of the board to suddenly just jump around and behind the enemy could cause issues, particularly if they're hitting with heavy firepower like Plasma Talons. Finally for the stratagems, there's one command point for Hunter's Trail. This one gives a Ravenwing mounted unit the option to make an objective a sticky objective if you held it in your command phase. That's the rule that means that the objective remain yours even if you move off it or you fail Battleshock, unless the opponent can actually hold it at the start or end of any one turn. Seems handy, and I guess it means that you could allow the fast moving Ravenwing to push up and keep on the offensive. You would have to be using it against an enemy army where they couldn't just easily put things on the objective though, otherwise it's going to be pointless. Still though, I'd say that's niche but usable. Overall for the stratagem section here, I'd say it's not awful, but most of it seems to be sort of mid-value as opposed to super high. Besides perhaps the Battleshock one, they all seem usable. The minus one to hit, I feel like you could use that quite a lot, though it's only sort of mid-value I think. The rest are all good in the right situation, though likely aren't going to be ones that you want to use every turn. Moving on to the enhancements though, and we've got four of these for the Ravenwing as well. These ones are all locked to Ravenwing keyword models, which doesn't give you that much choice. Basically it means that these have to go either on the Chaplain on Bike, or the Ravenwing Champion within the Command Squad, who picked up the character keyword within this update. First up we've got Master of Maneuver, which allows the Bearer's units to start in Strategic Reserve without counting towards the point limit for that, and then their units allowed to arrive from Strategic Reserve Round 1, or arrive from Strategic Reserve anywhere on the board including the enemy's deployment zone from Turn 2. This does seem really quite big and scary as it could affect really quite a big unit out there, and basically guarantee the Alpha Strike with some shooting rather than getting shot. You could potentially have 9 bikes with a Command Squad plus a Black Knight Squad turn up, and then they'd be able to get a plus 1 to charge from the Command Squad score rule. It does feel like there's a bit of trade-off versus the speed of the Raven Wing. But you're sort of not really using that if you're just going to put them in reserve anyway. And it could be kind of bad against armies that can screen really well. It'd be kind of a waste to have this squad just clattering against things that are really quite cheap chaff. Overall seems at least interesting though. Along with the rest of these, there seem like there's lots of ways to deliver Raven Wing units with a massive alpha strike against the enemy. Next up, we've got Master Crafted Weapon. A Raven Wing model gains precision in melee. I feel like that one would have to be super cheap to entice people to get it, probably like the 5 or 10 point mark. Precision isn't nothing, but it's also not really that exciting. I feel like a Chaplain or Raven Wing Champion might have a chance of one-shotting a character, but it's going to be kind of tight. Hopefully that one will just be a cheap points filler, if you happen to be, say, 5 or 10 points lower than your limit. Next up, we've got Mounted Strategist. This one's quite a nice one in that it allows advance and charge or fall back and charge for the unit, and combined with the detachment rule that means you're going very fast indeed. It kind of means that between this and the detachment rule you'd have the same as Samuel's rules. Pretty cool in that you could do a bit of a 1-2 punch with a Ravenwing unit, with say a unit of Black Knights it'd be a 12 inch move plus D6 advance, shoot with a bunch of Plasma Talons then charge in. It seems fairly scary to do that with a big bulky unit of any sort, and the Outriders could also be interesting given that they can auto advance 6 inches. Finally, as if that weren't enough alpha striking bikers for you, there's also Recon Hunter. This gives the bearers unit a 9 inch scout move, so loads of bikes in the midfield from turn 1. This one's quite a nice flexible one. If you get turn 1, they could perhaps push up the board and try and make a first turn charge. If the enemy gets turn 1, then you could use this to talk your squad behind terrain and stop it getting shot. You might want to pair it with an infiltrator type unit, maybe some scouts perhaps, as that could stop enemy scouts or infiltrators just from getting in the way and stopping this move going off at all. Overall, I feel like most of the enhancements are really quite interesting. I feel like these guys are really pushing the theme of the detachment to basically have big Ravenwing Alpha Strike turn 1, whether it's turning up out of reserves, scouting up the board or advancing and charging. Seems kind of likely that the Ravenwing will be able to strike some pretty powerful blows and early. Overall it does seem interesting enough, I think it is kind of reliant on the strength of the Black Knights and the Outrider squads to be able to compete though. One or both of those units is going to have to be sufficiently powerful enough to carry the army. 
I think that perhaps the biggest strength comes in the enhancements for the force, throwing bikers right into the enemy's face turn 1, and then the detachment core rule to allow a lot of scooty arounds to get lines of sight with other big heavy hitting vehicle shooting. Moving on to the Deathwing though, and next up we've got the Inner Circle Task Force. This one makes heavy use of the Deathwing keyword, and the core rule for the detachment is Vowed Targets, something that feels like it would work quite well in concert with Other Moments. In your command phase, it's another damage boost. You get to target one objective marker, and until the start of your next command phase, that objective marker is your Vowed Objective, and any Deathwing infantry units from your army that make an attack that targets an enemy unit within range of that objective marker get a big plus one to wounds. It's also relevant for a whole load of other stratagem and enhancement things. It's definitely a big damage boost, and it could potentially affect a few enemy units if they're trying to pile the objectives high with them. I guess you know your opponent will likely be putting at least some things on the objective as they'll need to score points with them, though I suppose it might be the case that they choose not to put as much as they might have otherwise, or might have chosen to keep some big heavy hitters off the objectives so as not to trigger this rule. It is kind of a bit in your opponent's control that way. For things that are on the objective though, you could combine it with Oath of Moment for re-roll hits and then also get the plus one to wound against the same target. Seems massive for taking down big enemy heavy hitters. And between all the Deathwing that you can use with this, there's quite a lot of scary stuff. All the Terminator data sheets, Blaine Guard, Stern Guard and Vanguard veterans, the Inner Circle companions, and interestingly most named characters that aren't the Lion and Samuel also have Deathwing. And I believe that that would mean that you could give it to their lead units. You could say have a unit leading some Hellblasters and get plus one to wound while they're trying to gun some enemies off an objective, which at least seems fairly threatening on paper. The vehicles like the Dreadnoughts, Repulsors and Land Raiders though don't really get much value out of the Deathwing keyword. Moving on to Stratagems next though, and for 1 CP we've got Martial Mastery. This gives Deathwing Infantry reroll wound rolls of 1 in melee, or rerolling all wound rolls if you're targeting something while you're in range of your vowed objective. For me the reroll ones part of it isn't likely to be enough to be exciting. It's going to equate to a plus 17% damage boost which isn't usually worth 1 CP unless literally every bit of damage is absolutely critical to swing a close combat. It does mean that Deathwing trying to attack something big and meaty on your vowed objective will be absolutely massive though. You'd have both plus 1 to wound and reroll those wound rolls so even big tough stuff you're wounding on a 5 plus you'd now be wounding those on a 4 plus re-rolling, and it could be particularly nice for Thunderhammers in the Terminator Assault Squad. You might be able to get some more devastating wounds that way. Overall, it just basically makes the detachment rule, but turns it up to 11. Seems very nice for dealing with really big tough stuff that's tried to take a point, like maybe an Imperial Knight. Next up, for one command point, there's Duty Unto Death. This is a fight on death one, on a 4 plus if they haven't already fought, and they get a plus one to that roll if they're on the Vowed Objective. These ones are situational, but okay if you do happen to be in that situation. If you've got a scary Deathwing unit that's just being wiped out by maybe a slightly fragile but very hard-hitting melee damage dealer, being able to punch back with a few power fists or a bunch of power sword attacks or something could be quite nice. And again, it kind of doubles up on the Vowed objective, as if they're fighting on death there, they'll also get the plus one to wound, I suppose, which could add up to even more meaningful damage. Perhaps could be good for more fragile things than Terminators as well, Things like Inner Circle Companions, or even Vanguard Veterans. Next up, there's a 1 command point one called Relic Teleportarium. This is one of the ones that allows you to deep strike anywhere that's greater than 3 inches away from enemies, that you can't charge after. These ones are generally really quite nice for dropping an enormous unit into the enemy backfield. Could be good for doing secondary objectives, or sneaking primary objectives, or just setting up for a really unfair fight with a whole bunch of Terminators against something light. Probably one of the better stratagems of the detachment, I think. For 1 CP, there's Wrath of the Lion, a Deathwing infantry unit that charged gets to roll 1 dice per each model in your unit. Each roll of a 4 plus will get you a mortal wound, though it's capped at 3 unfortunately. And as with the rest of them, everything gets better on your vowed objective, going up to a 3 plus chance on that. If you've got lots of models charging in, that could add up to a little bit more reliable damage. I feel like you want to at least have a 5 man squad with that, which is kind of fine for Terminators. That'll give you two or three mortal wounds, which I guess in some combats could maybe tip the balance if you've got something with extreme high toughness or high saves. It kind of feels like sort of bad tank shock, but for infantry, or at least having it as an option does help out. I guess it could be interesting to help Vanguard veterans just punch up a little bit more against tougher things. A few extra mortal wounds could make a serious difference to how much damage they manage to do to something on the charge. Next up, there's the all-reliable Armour of Contempt for 1 CP. 
Worsening AP is pretty great when you're using Terminator armor or 2 plus Dreadnoughts. Could be quite nice for land raiders as well. And again, will remain a staple, probably even more meaningful in this one compared with the Raven Wing. Finally, for 1 CP, there is another durability one called Unmatched Fortitude. That one's also a battle tactic. In the enemy shooting phase, one Deathwing infantry unit targeted becomes minus one to wound for enemy enemy weapons that are greater strength than your toughness. So I guess typically strength six or above for Terminators. Like the Ravenwing one, that's going to be one to weigh up versus Armor of Contempt. Occasionally it will be the right choice, particularly for the times when the Armor of Contempt isn't going to make any difference anyway. Say if it was AP zero or you're going to be on your invulnerable save regardless. Not bad to have the option though, and you could potentially have it free with Terminator Captains as it is a battle tactic. Maybe a little bit of a redundant one when Armour of Contempt is an option though, at least some of the time. Overall, maybe not too bad on the stratagems there. Relic Teleportarium is definitely very scary to get Terminators where they shouldn't be. Otherwise, Martial Mastery does look very meaningful if you do target something good on the Vowed Objective. I feel like that and the Teleport one are probably my two favourites. Next up for the enhancements, Deathwing Assault is 30 points. All of these are locked to Deathwing models, so typically that's going to be standard generic Terminator characters like Chaplains, Librarians or Captains. I guess you could give them to Bladeguard Ancients as well, but not this one as it has to be a model that has Deep Strike. This one basically allows your unit to arrive turn 1 from Deep Strike in the reinforcement step of your first movement phase. So potentially a whole bunch of Terminators just thrown straight into the midfield there. I think you might even be able to stack it with Relic Teleportarium as well to put them somewhere very crazy. You wouldn't be able to use Rapid Ingress with it as it does specify the reinforcement step of your movement phase, not the enemies. And I guess you'd have your Terminators teleport down, unleash a whole bunch of Storm Bolter and maybe Cyclone Missile Launcher Fire. And then unless you are using that Relic Teleportarium, have around about a 50-50 chance to make a 9-inch charge if you budget a command point re-roll for it. So definitely not something that you could ever rely on making that charge. But if you did, then that could be terminated in combat right from turn 1, which does sound scary. Seems like a fairly threatening one, that. I feel like that's one of my favourite enhancements out of them. Otherwise, we've got Champion of the Death Wing. This one gives you lethal hits for the bearer's melee weapons, plus critical hits on a 5+, plus if the bearer's on the vowed objective. I guess could be scary enough for the Terminator Captain, who's got quite a good melee profile. I feel like that one's probably one to look at if it's nice and cheap, and if you just need something to fill up points. I guess lethal hits isn't terrible though, it would help the bearer punch up a little bit more against tanks and vehicles, though just on one model and not on the rest of the squad, it's a little bit more limited. Next up we've got Eye of the Unseen, this one's a command point farming one, a 5 plus to regenerate a command point when one spent on the bearer's unit, going up to a 4 plus if they're on the vowed objective. This wouldn't be too bad if it were cheap, even if the chance to refund the command point is kind of low. Though it kind of depends on whether or not you're running Azrael in your army list. If you are, this will be entirely redundant due to the command point farming limits. I rate it kind of passably good if he's not there, and just one to ignore if he is. Finally, there's Singular Will. This allows your units to pile in or consolidate an additional 3 inches. A little bit more pressure in the fight phase to get your models into combat, and then potentially move on to tie up the next thing or move on to an objective. These ones tend to feel just a little bit less interesting as a rule that you could buy in pre-game, as opposed to something that you could just buy in situationally with a command point, if it happened to be relevant in the situation they found themselves in. I guess it seems handy enough if you do have your big Deathwing unit move in, wipe out a unit, and then you've got a lot more range to tag the next thing, which could really disrupt the enemy. Depends on whether you'd value it over maybe Champion of the Deathwing for lethal hits, or potentially Deathwing Assault. Definitely not unhelpful though, and could allow you to make some big plans. Overall, again with the Raven Wing, this is a detachment that relies on certain units being good. Currently most of the veterans in Warhammer 40k are sort of middling in value right now, which might not be quite enough to carry an army, given that you're really going to need the Deathwing infantry models to really pull their weight here. If and when Terminators ever get good though, it does look like it offers them some really quite big support. I really like both Deathwing Assault for teleporting in early and the teleport just outside of 3 inches stratagem, they both seem pretty great. The core rule for the faction is pretty useful as well, with damage boosts going on turn on turn as opposed to all in one big go for the first company task force for the core codex space marines. If terminators do get extra good, this does feel like a credible way that you might be able to run them. 
Finally, for the core detachment, we've got standard Green Wing Dark Angels in the Unforgiven Task Force. This one's meant to represent a more balanced army with options that can support all the Dark Angels units, not just a subset of them. This one's the one that they had in the index, and unfortunately it is just generally considered very underpowered compared with the Codex Space Ruined detachments. Very rarely run competitively, if at all. And it's the one with the slightly odd theming where the Dark Angels get some boosts when they're battle shocked, something that might happen from time to time on smaller depleted units in the game, but sort of scattergun and might not trigger on the things that you most want it to. And the core rule is maybe a bit unhelpfully passive. Broadly speaking, changes from the index have been kind of limited. The core rule remains the same, and the only big change is to actually kind of make one of the stratagems worse, in my opinion. And overall, I can't really see this one competing against the core codex space brains in its current form. Going through the rules one by one, though, and Grim Resolve now still means that if you're battle shocked, you get to still retain OC1. It means that if you're battle shocked on an objective that your opponent isn't contesting, then you'll still be able to hold it. Which definitely isn't nothing, though you do take the other negative penalties of Battle Shock. In plenty of games, it just literally won't matter whatsoever. Though from time to time, it could be kind of big and maybe swing a 5 victory points your way or not. And it could be an okay counter to certain Battle Shock focused armies out there, say Chaos Knights, maybe Tyranids with their Shadow and the Warp. In those matchups, it is genuinely kind of good, but otherwise, against the field, it is a bit rubbish. And if there's any strength to be had in this attachment, it's going to be more from the stratagems and enhancements, I'd argue. Speaking of which, getting into those, for 1 CP, we've got Unforgiven Fury. That gives you lethal hits for 1 CP, either shooting or in the fight phase. Definitely a nice boost to have, particularly if you're targeting things that you're wounding on a 5 plus. That equates to a 50% damage boost there, which is good. And then this one goes next level if any friendly Astartes units are currently battle shocked on the board, meaning that you trigger those critical hits on a 5 plus, so you'd be handing out a whole load of auto wounds there. Overall, though, just pop up lethal hits on anything in the army at any time is just pretty handy to have at base. If your opponent happens to a battle shock something, which might happen from time to time, then it could get kind of ridiculous in terms of allowing the Unforgiven to punch up against things that might have been wounding on a 5 or 6, and it is a battle tactic as well to be able to get it for free. I would say that this one's one of the stronger detachment stratagems. Next up, for 1 CP, there's Intractable. This one allows you to fall back, shoot and charge. Kind of like a pop-up Gladius-style tactical doctrine when you need it. And this would be quite good if, say, you've got some powerful shooting locked up, like some Eradicators that got tagged in combat, or maybe a big unit of Deathwing, or other heavy hitters that want to move on and hit something else. I do feel like there's plenty of times when using this would be a good idea. Could be fun on big units of Ravenwing Black Knights as well, to get a Plasma Talon volley and a charge off on something that could be quite far away. As per normal, there's Armour of Contempt to worsen the AP by 1, we've talked about that plenty. For 1 CP, there's Fire Discipline as well. In the shooting phase, your unit gains the Assault keyword, the Heavy keyword, and ignores cover. That one's got quite a lot of utility between all those keywords, but you're never going to be able to use both Assault and Heavy at the same time, as they're mutually exclusive. Ignore's cover could actually genuinely be worth it just on itself if you're targeting something with a very high save in cover. Assault could be quite nice if you needed to scoot to an objective and you still want to maintain your shooting, and heavy could be another meaningful damage boost to add to ignore cover if your unit can afford to stay still this turn. I perhaps argue that none of them really are just super high value for one CP, but taken together in interesting combinations, sometimes the combined total could be worth it. Grim Retribution is a 1 command point 1 to return fire at full ballistic skill if an enemy's just shot you and killed one of your Astartes models. You have to target the enemy unit that just attacked you, and you could get a good shooting phase out of this. It does mean that you're going to have to use it on infantry or biker units though, as there's the requirements to actually have a model slain as opposed to just take damage. This one's kind of in your opponent's control a little bit, but could maybe be surprisingly punishing and almost a bit gotchery. So if they did take some pot shots with a kind of fragile unit against a unit that could easily kill them with a bunch of bolter fire and things, this could make you think twice about, say, firing some pot shots into a big ranked up unit of aggressors with a whole load of bolt storms that could just clear out infantry wholesale. Finally, we've got the nerfed one, which is Unbreakable Lines. This one's a battle tactic for 2 CP. Previously, it was only 1. Now it gives you a minus 1 to wound when the enemy charges you. So if they were wounding Space Marines on a 3+, plus, they're now wound on a 4. And you also have to declare this in the charge phase as well, so a little bit of forward thinking is required. At 2 CP, I just don't think that this is amazingly good value. It's not a bad defensive stratagem, but Armour of Contempt is usually going to be the better bet for your CP. 
and it also felt that the minus one damage version of this that it was before when it was one CP was kind of better as well, with the right things attacking you if you were damaged two weapons going into damage two space marines, it could basically double your survivability, which would be pretty massive. Overall, I feel like the stratagems are a much stronger point of the detachment compared with the core rule. Plenty of useful stuff for firepower dark angels and particularly infantry. Lethal hits and fall back and shoot are both handy to have. And fire discipline and grim retribution both could be okay in the right circumstances. Overall, feels like quite a tactically flexible set of stratagems, making most things aren't usually going to be enormously stand out in their own rights, but lots of them could have good situations that come up mid game. Lastly, for the Unforgiven Task Force, we've got the enhancements. The Shroud of Heroes was 25 points pre-codex. This one's a 2 plus chance to resurrect the model on death with 3 wounds remaining, though coming back at 4 wounds if they were battle shocked. That one's not awful, though maybe it's a bit questionable at 25 points. It does basically require your character to have had its squad shot to death, though it could be kind of disruptive if you did have really quite a big and melee threatening character and you knew their squad was playing very aggressively. Having one more turn of the character acting could be worth that 25 points if it happens. Stubborn Tenacity was 15 points pre-codex, this one's a plus one to hit for the bearer's unit if they've taken casualties, and then going up to a plus one to wound as well for the bearer's unit if they've both taken at least one casualty and they're below starting strength. The printed cost for the codex for this one is 20 points so it's gone up plus five, and for this one I'm perhaps in a little bit too minds about it, it's always just a little bit situational as the opponent might just wipe out an entire squad in one go without just doing you the nice favour of causing it a bit of damage but not killing it, and as per the rest of the things with the battle shock, it's kind of situational whether you'd ever get the plus one to wound thing or not. Maybe it could be nice enough for a unit of say 10 terminators where they're likely to survive after taking damage or a really big squad of perhaps Ravenwing Black Knights. Could be interesting enough that if you overcharged a whole bunch of plasma for them, you might well kill one of them and then that could actually give you a big damage boost if you went on to the fight phase after that I guess. Could maybe be fun for things like Hellblasters with a lieutenant for that reason as well maybe. Moving on, we've got Weapons of the First Legion, which is basically the same as the Heavenfall Blade, but renamed. That one remains 15 points printed in the Codex, and it gives you plus 1 attack, plus 1 strength, and plus 1 damage to the bearer's melee weapons, going up to a plus 2 of each if the bearer is battle shocked. For 15 points, again, I'd rate that as kind of fine, an okay upgrade to fill up a last few points if you're trying to finish up an army list, and you don't have quite enough points to buy in an extra unit. I feel like that's fairly nice on a power fist. Strength 9, extra attack and damage 3 is legitimately more fighting, a lot nicer at punching down enemy terminators and things. Again, there's no actual real rules change here, but there's a solid enough combat upgrade on a frontline squad. Finally, and what I'd argue is probably the best upgrade out of all these enhancements is the Pennant of Remembrance, which still seems to be printed at 10 points in the Codex. That'd be unchanged from the Index if it is maintained after the Munitorum Field Manual update. This one's an ancient upgrade that gives you Essex plus Feel No Pain to the unit, going up to a big 4 plus Feel No Pain if the bearer squad ever gets battle shocked. I feel like this one is usable for either a Blade Guard or Terminator Ancient. Getting the Feel No Pain for 10 points is a very, very good upgrade, and so much so that it might actually make you tempted to take those data sheets. They do help out your objective control and give you a combat boost of one sort or another, whether it's the Terminator one of getting more dangerous as your squad takes casualties, or the Blade Guard one of the single plus one attack boost. Overall, the 10 points for a Feel No Pain is just excellent. The only major downside is that it's attached to Ancients, which are considered a bit weaker than some of the other characters. Overall though, it is kind of a shame that the Unforgiven Task Force didn't get a bit more help here. As mentioned, the core rule for it I think is really quite a letdown. Definitely helps you out on objectives from time to time, but just doesn't add the same sort of strength that most of the other detachment rules do. Most of the stratagems are kind of usable enough. Good support for ranged shooting armies in particular, and I do quite like the lethal hits one. Though it is a shame that one of the best stratagems in Unbreakable Lines went off a command point, I feel like that one makes the detachment weaker. Otherwise, for their points cost, I feel like all of the enhancements are at least usable. Probably my favourites are the Pendant of Remembrance for the 10 points, maybe followed by the 15 points weapons of the First Legion. They're both cheap if they maintain the points cost here in the Munitorum Field Manual, and could be good for filling up the last few points. Overall for the detachments, given that the Unforgiven Task Force was kind of seen as bad and seems to have got flatly worse in this, I guess we'd really be looking at the other two for the strength of the army as it stands, though nothing to stop you playing Vanguard or Gladius or Ironstorm Dark Angels if you'd like to still.
for the Deathwing and the Ravenwing ones. I think it will depend on the strength of the Terminator units plus the Biker units, both within this codex and in Codex Space Marines more generally. Both of those have got really interesting options for getting their units where they need to be. The Deathwing with their close range deep strike and their turn 1 deep strike, plus their damage rule is kind of handy. The Raven Wing I think are mainly enthused about for all the enhancements they can get. Three different ways of delivering your Raven Wing units to the Alpha Strike, either out of reserves, advance and charge or scouts. A detachment rule definitely isn't too bad for some heavy firepower to back them up as well. Could be interesting to run some Gladiator Lancers or Firepower Dreadnoughts in the backfield while your bikes go zooming off destroying things. Again for raw power I think we'll have to wait for the full Munitor and Field Manual points and given that there's the balanced data slate coming very soon for the Space Marines it might have interesting stuff either for Terminators or perhaps for Outriders. Depending on what we get for both of those I genuinely feel like either of those detachments could be kind of interesting. Talking of datasheets though, let's get on to the datasheets within the Codex. Inside Codex Dark Angels, there's 16 unique datasheets in the core rules of the book. Several datasheets have been removed as mentioned, and we'll go through those individually first. The only new unit in the book are the Inner Circle Companions, with their Calibre Knight Greatswords that we'll go through after that, and then we'll talk about the rest of them one by one. They're broadly the same as the Index, but a lot of them have had small tweaks in one way or another. The broad theme of it though does seem to be that a lot of the units have got slightly weaker in power level. A bunch of small nerfs to stat lines or special rules that Dark Angels players really haven't been too enthusiastic about. Maybe some of the biggest losers here are Lionel Johnson, the Deathwing Knights and the Landspeed of Vengeance all for different reasons. Though this will all have to be taken in context of their upcoming downloadable points. Provided they did drop in points to compensate for this they could still be absolutely very strong for the faction. And I just really hope that Games Workshop manages to land this and get it right. As mentioned, the points cost in the Codex are printed here, though are redundant. I will mention a few of them, but I feel like it's kind of unhelpful too, given that we know that they're going to be superseded. There are a couple of absolutely bonkers ones in here, like 290 points for 5 Deathwing Knights, which in no way reflects their ability. If they did stick at that value, then of course they'd be utterly awful. But until we know the final digital points, I'm not going to get too stressed about that. I feel like even Games Workshop could tell that that would be ludicrously overcosted. First up though, let's start with some of the worst news. There's three removed datasheets here in Codex Dark Angels, which is quite a lot given that they only started with I guess 18 units before. And there has been a heavy war gear restriction to one other one in the Deathwing Terminator squad. Going through those, first up we've lost the Ravenwing Talon Master, that was based on the now removed land speeder kit, so that one was easy to see going away. Sadly the twin assault cannons and twin heavy bolters of this Ravenwing style lieutenant won't be great in the battlefield anymore. I guess he'd probably get Legends rules, and I feel like that one's kind of a shame, as he's a model that quite a few Dark Angels players might have got in their collection. He has been a pretty interesting choice for an addition or so now. In a similar vein, we no longer have a Deathwing Strike Master for the standard Deathwing Terminators. This was previously built out of the Deathwing Command Squad box, which is now a thing of the past. Again, that means that the Deathwing have lost access to their Lethal Hits character, which could be quite big for certain things like the Gladius Fire Discipline combo, which could no longer apply to big ranked up Terminator squads. I suppose if you still have the model, you could just use him as a standard Deathwing Terminator at least. Another big loss is the Deathwing Terminator Command Squad. Again, that one was kind of easy to see coming, given that the Deathwing Knight box set replaced the standard Deathwing one. The standard Deathwing one is now represented by an upgrade sprue with the Plasma Cannon and Watcher in the Dark, but there's no Apothecary, Ancient or Champion bits on that one. So it seems that for now at least, the Deathwing Terminator Command Squad will be a thing of the past. This one will be another small competitive blow to the army, I think. I felt like there were really interesting units to build around with some good advantages built in, the extra objective control from the standard, and in particular the healing models from the Apothecary. The model revival just feels a lot more powerful on Terminators than most other places out there. A big tanky unit where you could resurrect some really interesting models, and just with their raw survivability they were more likely to be damaged but not destroyed due to the opponent failing to kill them. Kind of a shame for those guys. Finally, some war gear options have been lost on the standard Deathwing Terminator squad. I feel like that'll be a big blow to some people. You can no longer mix the Terminator Assault squad and the standard Terminator squad's gear within the same unit as they don't come in any one box. Again, that was one that I kind of saw coming there. Games Workshop do like to keep one unit per one kit and they didn't fill that bill. 
This will mean that the data sheet is a bit weaker as you're no longer able to mix, say, heavy weapons and thunder hammers and storm shields, which was quite a common combo. I feel like there probably will be quite a few terminators out there modelled with cyclone missile launcher, thunder hammer and storm shield, as that had been a somewhat common loadout in the past. Overall, it's certainly never a great feeling when entirely game legal kits that Games Workshop has had on sale for quite a long time just suddenly go away. And it does spell a bit of a word of warning for what might happen to the Raven Wing next time round. Seems likely that the next major release for the Dark Angels will probably be a Raven Wing one. I guess we'll get some Primaris versions of Black Knights and maybe the Raven Wing Command Squad, but we don't know 100% if that unit will survive. Otherwise, on to more positive things, let's get on to the data sheets that are here. And first up, we'll start out with the brand new and shiny Inner Circle Companions, generally very well received as new Dark Angels hooded veterans. A bit of a throwback to their company veterans in ages past, though it seems that the law behind these guys are redeemed for them that have taken a vow of silence, fighting alongside the Dark Angels but never communicating with their battle brothers. The miniatures look quite fun and seem like they'll be sold in groups of three similar to Blade Guard veterans as they can be fielded in squad sizes of 3 to 6. As with everything in this codex, points costs are not yet confirmed. We need to wait for the digital download. The printed costs for these in the book are 105 points per 3, and if that were true, that would be very bad news for them, as they wouldn't be worth that. But even with entirely new units, Games Workshop does have fairly good precedence with not costing them the same amount as the listed points cost. Say, for example, the jump pack intercessors wound up being cheaper. In any case, you get 3 to 6 of them in a unit, They've got the Deathwing and the Tacticus keywords. The Deathwing one means that they're a bit more relevant in the Inner Circle task force. And you can attach characters to them as if they were a Stern Guard veteran squad. That's good news there, as they've got about some of the most flexible character attachments out of any of the Space Marine units. Their stat line is somewhat similar to Blade Guard. They move 6 inches, have got Toughness 4 with a 3 plus save, 3 wounds, Leadership 6 and Objective Control 2. It seems that that banner doesn't have any in game rules, though I do wonder whether or not. To represent its effects, they decided just to roll in Objective Control 2 into their raw stat lines, as opposed to having the more add-on bonus rule that they get of plus one Objective Control, though admittedly that is a little more powerful. In any case, they don't have any war gear options, they're all armed with Caliber Knight Greatswords, and these things strike at four attacks at weapon skill 3 plus, strength 6 and AP 1. The Greatswords get a sweep or strike mode, if they sweep they pick up sustained hits 2, so she'll get a lot more hits on their opponents, and they're just damage 1. And when they strike, they get lethal hits and damage too, so a bit better at punching up against tough vehicles and things. Overall, it's not an awful melee profile. You would get a good amount of mid-AP wounds on whatever you're attacking. I am just really kind of surprised, though, that they chose to make these guys AP1. Seems very inconsistent with other Space Marine power weapons out there, like, say, the Blade Guard Mastercrafted Power Swords. They're AP2 and damage too. I've just got no idea why these guys would have the same AP as Chainswords, and it really does not help them out against more elite infantry like Terminators or big tough vehicles. I feel like most Dark Angels players might have preferred to have them AP2, or maybe AP3 if Games Workshop were feeling generous for the massive swords here, and just have them pay a higher points cost if necessary for that. Otherwise they feel like they're just going to be a sort of infantry bully type unit, kind of good against Space Marines or lighter infantry, but really struggling against 2 plus saves or heavy armour. Otherwise, they do get a sort of bodyguard protection rule. They're minus one to hit if they're led by a character, so a bit more durable there. And to make those great swords a bit more dangerous in close combat, they get plus one to hit for enemies with a character keyword. So a fair bit of the time, they might well be hitting a bit more effectively in close combat. Overall, though, between all that, if they're going to get a look in, I feel like they need to be somewhat significantly cheaper than Blade Guard at 90 points currently. Maybe somewhere around the 75 to 80 points sort of mark could have people interested in them. I feel like the miniatures do seem pretty cool, and it would be good to have a good excuse to fill them in-game. Perhaps for characters to go alongside them, Azrael seems like a good fit, given that he gives them a 4 plus invulnerable save, and turns them from a pretty fragile unit into really quite a tanky one, plus adding a little bit of extra quality melee. Moving on to the existing datasheets that have had updates though, starting out we've got the Deathwing Terminator squad. Pre-codates they were 200 points for 5, or 400 for 10, and they have a standard Terminator stat line. Toughness 5, 3 wounds, and a 2 plus save with a 4 plus invulnerable. Terminators are tanky and hard to take down. For changes in the codex, they picked up a teleport homer, given that they'll be represented by the core Terminator kit now. That's the rule written here below. Basically, you nominate a point on the battlefield and have the potential to threaten rapid ingress near that for 0 CP, 
they're often the opponent might just march up to it and remove the marker. I'd rate that as a small advantage, not a big one. In a lot of games, it just won't really matter too much. Otherwise, they picked up the Deathwing keyword, as you'd expect. And as mentioned, the big nerf to their data sheet is they can't take the Terminator Assault Squad loadouts anymore. So things like the Thunder Hammers and the Storm Shields and the Lightning Claws. That definitely does feel like a blow to their power, given that it was often quite popular to take, say, the Heavy Weapon and then a bunch of tanky Storm Shields and Thunder Hammers to back them up for the rest of the unit. Otherwise though, for actual unique selling points for their datasheet, there's basically two now. They get the option to take the Plasma Cannon, as that's still available on the Deathwing Upgrade Sprue. Though personally I'd say that the damage profile doesn't outcompete the Cyclone Missile Launcher for me. Plus you have the opportunity to lose Terminators via a Hazardous Roll, which is actually quite a big disadvantage for big pricey models like this. Otherwise, compared with the standard datasheet, their Deathwing Rule is better than the standard Fury of the First Special Rule. Both these and the generic Terminators get to get plus one to hit against the Oath of Moment target, which is nice. But the Deathwing Terminators also get the advantage of still ignoring hit roll weapon skill or ballistic skill modifiers. That was something that was lost by the core Space Marine Terminators in the new Space Marine Codex for 10th edition. It won't always be applicable, but it's handy to have for certain units that you might be fighting. Nice to guarantee that their damage output won't be wavered by stealth or anything. Overall though, the changes do just make them very similar to the standard Terminator datasheet, just the Plasma Cannon, the Deathwing thing, and their Watcher in the Dark for a once per game 4 plus save against mortal wounds. Between Ignore's modifiers and the Watcher, I could see them being priced just a small amount over the standard Terminators. I feel like for those advantages though, they probably shouldn't be more than 5 or 10 points more than them, otherwise you might just want to take the generic datasheet. Moving on, we've got the updated datasheet for the Deathwing Knights. Pre-Codex, they were 235 or 470 points. Though their printed cost in the Codex is a big 290 points for some reason. No idea who came up with that number. That would genuinely be awful if they went up by that much. I strongly suspect that that would be far, far higher than their eventual cost in the Munitor and Field Manual will be. The Deathwing Knights, with their brand new kits, have seen quite a lot of datasheet updates. And overall, if anything, they have been toned down a bit on a per-model basis. Though, as I'll keep banging on about in the Codex, it doesn't necessarily mean they've got worse until we know their points. For the majority of the squad, you've got a war gear choice in either the Mace of Absolution or a Power Weapon now. The Mace of Absolution is maybe a bit sad to go down from damage 3 to damage 2. You now get 4 attacks hitting on a 2 at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2. Kind of a shame that they won't be able to punch up quite so hard against hard targets or 3 wound infantry. Otherwise, the new option is their Power Sword loadout, which gets you 5 attacks at Strength 6, AP 2 and Damage 1. So you basically gain an extra attack and an extra AP for the loss of the damage. And in all honesty, those two profiles do seem at least somewhat balanced against each other. The bases will be better against multi-wound and two-wound things for the most part, though not really all that much. And they'll be kind of similar if they're going against high saves like 2 plus armor saves. Overall, I'd say that both loadouts seem kind of viable and fairly well balanced. Realistically now it's going to fall to the Nightmaster to do the heavy lifting for the unit. He gets a choice of two different weapons, either the Flail of the Unforgiven, which is rebranded as a Deathwing Great Weapon. That has the same stat line at Strength 6, AP 2, Damage 2 with 5 attacks, with devastating wounds and sustained hits. Really quite a nice general purpose profile. We can swap it out for a Relic Weapon. That one again is very general purpose, 6 attacks at strength 7 and damage 2 with lethal hits rather than the devastating wounds and sustained. To be honest both of those are pretty good profiles that will be fairly even against most targets. Otherwise for notable details on the data sheet, you can't mix and match between the power weapons and mace of absolution, it is one or the other for the entire squad. And it does unfortunately appear that the squad size has been locked to 5 models only, previously you could take them in enormous 10 model squads of them. But now you're locked to just 5. That is a disadvantage for really big anvil type units like these. Where you might want characters to lead them and be an efficient buff choice for a huge unit. And they were a popular choice for doing shenanigans such as giving them infiltrate in vanguard. Which could be another scary way of getting a whole load of terminators right up and in the face of the enemy. Otherwise for datasheet things they still have the watcher in the dark for a feel no pain against mortal wounds once per game. They still get their inner circle rule for minus one damage, which is really quite massive as they get four wounds with their storm shields. They are very tanky terminators to take out, and if they do get any sort of points cut due to their lesser damage profile, they're going to swing to being even more the tanky individual terminators that don't do as much damage, but can weather a massive storm for the cost. Finally, they have also picked up a teleport homer that, as mentioned, you might get more or less use out of, and they do have the deathwing keyword as well. 
Overall, between the changes, though, I feel like they are overall nerfed. I'd hope they might go down a bit from 235, and the squad size thing is a bit of a blow. That will make them less efficient for synergies, stratagems, and characters. Moving on to the Ravenwing squads next, and first up we have the Ravenwing Black Knights. They were 110 points, or 220 per 6 before the Codex. They're pretty similar to how they were before, just gaining the Ravenwing keyword. They're still fast-moving bikes with 3 wounds apiece, toughness 5, and their 5 plus invulnerable save to represent the Ravenwing Jink. And they come equipped with the fairly fearsome Plasma Talons. 2 shots out to 18 inches, strength 8, AP 3, and damage 2 if you overcharge. And if you're within 9 inches, you get Rapid Fire 1, so that'd be 3 shots at close range. In combat, they're at least fairly capable of skirmishing with things. 3 attacks at strength 5, AP 2, and damage 1. And they have a Knights of Caliban rule where they get anti-monster and anti-vehicle on the charge. It's still not going to make them particularly efficient monster or vehicle hunters given that they've got damage 1 attacks, but means that they should at least do something. They count as outriders for character attachment, so you could lead them with a chaplain on bike. And you can now lead them with the Ravenwing Command Squad that we'll get onto in a second. Overall, these guys didn't tend to make it into competitive list at 110 points, so again, I would hope for a points reduction. They do seem a lot more interesting with the support and delivery systems from the Ravenwing detachment, though. The Ravenwing Command Squad, as mentioned, has changed really quite a lot. Pre Codex, it was 130 points or 260. But I wonder if the points cost might change a bit, given that it's really quite changed in format. The Command Squad is now a character unit, the Company Champion gets the character thing, and they're a leader choice that can lead either Outriders or Ravenwing Black Knights. So given that these are a three-man squad, you could have a squad of nine Black Knights or ten Outriders, including an ATV. Really quite a massive unit of Ravenwing there. The Champion gaining the character keyword also means that he can take enhancements, very relevant for the Ravenwing detachment and could be interesting for other stuff as well. Kind of interesting that they're basically going to be the generic Ravenwing HQ choice. Otherwise for the units, they're bikers that are kind of similar to the Ravenwing Black Knights, except they get 4 wounds rather than 3 now. That's another improvement over the previous datasheet. You can't take the extra 3 Black Knights in the unit as you could before. That's to be represented by taking them attached to other units I guess. They come with the same Plasma Talons and the Black Knight Combat Weapon, though the Champion does hit significantly harder with 6 attacks, Strength 5, AP 2 and Damage 2. And the 3 Specialists each give the squad a different special rule. The Apothecary's Narthesium allows you to revive a slain model besides characters or Invader ATVs. Seems they had no desire to return to the shenanigans of ATV Resurrection from early 9th edition. The Astartes Banner gives them plus 1 objective control, which makes them immune to battle shock somewhat. And the champion also comes with a rule of plus one to advance and charge, which is very nice all around. Could be quite good if the squad chooses to arrive from reserve with that Ravenwing enhancement. You also get heroic intervention for zero CP, which does mean that they could actually threaten to protect other units. Overall, I feel like if these guys are costed right, this could be a very interesting big Ravenwing unit. Potentially nine Black Knights, or being able to use efficient enhancements and stratagems does seem like you could do big plays with it. It'd definitely be a costly option which will be enough to be really quite threatening between all those plasma attacks and a whole bunch of power weapons. Otherwise, we've got the Ravenwing vehicles in the land speeders and the planes. The Ravenwing Dark Shroud is 125 points, basically unchanged since the index, besides being given the Ravenwing keyword. It's a big chunky land speeder with a 14-inch move, toughness 8 and 10 wounds with a 3 plus save and a 5 plus invulnerable, so sort of middling durability for that 1, 2, 5 points. It comes with an assault cannon mounted, I'd usually choose that over the heavy bolter personally, though I guess both are kind of fine. And its special rule is its icon of Old Caliban, a 6 inch aura of units within 6 inches gaining stealth and the benefit of cover. Minus 1 to hit and plus 1 to your saves if you can't get cover otherwise is generally quite nice. Cover in 10th edition I suppose is pretty easy to come by though, so that bit might be less useful than the minus 1 to hit. Overall, I'd say it's not awful though, 125 points for extra durability in the centre of your army could be alright. Maybe have a turn or two of making the core of your Dark Angel's force harder for the enemy to kill at range, and then go off and just be a nuisance unit in its own right with a bit of firepower, and maybe locking up the enemy or reaching objectives. The Landspeed of Vengeance though hasn't fared quite so well in the Codex update. Prior to the Codex, it was 160 points, not really very commonly taken. Though in the Codex it seems to have had just one big nerf to its Plasma Storm battery, which has gone from being a very general purpose and scary weapon to one that's a lot more focused on more elite infantry killing. The Plasma Storm battery is its big twin-linked plasma cannon. 
36 inches, D6 plus 1 shots, and hitting at strength 9, AP3, and damage 2 on the overcharge profile with twin links. Previously though, it used to be damage 2 on its undercharge profile and damage 3 on its overcharge profile, making it really quite a good killer of terminators and things. Not really too sure why they did that to be honest, given the size of those plasma cannons, I think it kind of made sense that they'd be able to be fairly general purpose. Shooting down terminators did feel at least fairly law appropriate for it and threatening enemy medium vehicles. With only damage 2 though, it's just going to be far less of a threat. Otherwise it does come with the same assault cannon or heavy bolter as the Dark Shroud, and its special rule is Storm of Vengeance to be able to return fire when an enemy kills an Adeptus Astartes unit within 6 inches, though it can't use it if the enemy shoots down this thing first. Overall this really is quite a big nerf to the Land Speed of Vengeance, which wasn't really considered standout good before. It would have to come down by a massive amount from 160 points to really be worth it with these sort of rules. Maybe somewhere in the region of between 100 to 120 points would be a lot more tempting for it. 160 points would now be ludicrously overcosted. Next up, we've got the Ravenwing Flyers, the Dark Talon, and the Nephilim. Pre Codex, the Dark Talon was 210 points, a toughness 8 flyer with 11 wounds, a 3 plus save, and a 5 plus invulnerable, and the hover keyword. For weaponry, the Dark Talon gets two Hurricane Bolters, so really quite a lot of twin linked anti horde shots that should be able to get up close quite quickly. Plus the genuinely fairly scary Rift Cannon, D3 plus 1 shots at 18 inches, Strength 16, AP4, Damage 3, and Devastating Wounds. The Dark Talon signature move is the Stasis Bomb. Once per battle, after it's done a normal move, you can select one enemy unit besides aircraft. That unit gets to roll a D6. On a 1-3 to three, it can't advance or fall back in the opponent's next movement phase. And even more devastatingly, on a 4-6, to six, the opponent's unit can't move at all, and instead must remain stationary. The rule genuinely is quite good, but it does depend on the Dark Talon having something meaningful to move over. I feel like a lot of the time it's going to be using that 20 inch movement as opposed to its unlimited flyer movement, so it might not always be able to drop a bomb on exactly what it wants to. The only major change to the datasheet is that the status bomb ability means that you can only drop one per turn. Even if you have multiple Dark Talons in your army, you can't bomb two different units, though I think that was kind of rare that people would be trying to do that anyway. Again, I think would need to come down from 210 points to be particularly competitive. Though I feel like this is more an interesting unit than most, it does have some genuinely quite scary firepower against its targets, and that movement debuff could be kind of brutal if backed up by melee things, use the no fall back thing and then charge them with something else. That could absolutely mess up enemy gun lines plans. Next up, we've got the Nephilim Jet Fighter. Pre-Codex, this was 195 and kind of a similar sort of points cost to the Dark Talon. I did see some people wondering whether or not this one might keep the hover keyword or not, given that it feels like a bit more of a dogfighter compared with the Dark Talon maybe, though it does seem that both planes did keep the hover keyword here. Otherwise this thing either gets an Avenger Mega Bolter with 10 heavy bolter shots weighed up against two LAS cannons. In general people tend to skew a bit more towards anti-tank in 10th edition, though I feel like as you're basically almost getting 3.5 heavy bolters for this, the choice is actually a bit closer than some if you did want a bit more anti-infantry. Otherwise it does also get a twin heavy bolter on top of its regular armament, plus the Black Sword missiles which are fairly general purpose and get anti-fly 2 plus. I'd say that compared with some other space marine flyers it is fairly threatening and a little bit tougher as well. Enemies get minus 1 to hit it and a further minus 1 to wound as well if it gets attacked by a fly model, which isn't too bad given that quite a few gun platforms do have that keyword. Even with that though I wouldn't consider it tough for the cost and it's definitely paying a premium for its mobility. And again, I think it would need to come down from 195 points if it wanted to be competing with the more primary Space Marine gun line elements, things like Gladiator Lancers, Ballistas, Dreadnoughts, or various other big guns. Moving on, let's talk characters. And starting out, let's talk about Lionel Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels. He was 380 points before the Codex, though his reprinted Codex cost is 365. Not that that necessarily reflects what he'll be in the Munitorum Field Manual. The line has very similar stats to his brother Gilliman, an 8 inch move, toughness 9, a 2 plus save with 10 wounds, so he's going to need anti-tank firepower to take him down, and the Emperor's Shield gives him a 3 plus invulnerable save. Unfortunately though, the line did take a couple of fairly big nerfs going from the Index to the Codex, the biggest being that he's no longer minus 1 to wound with the Emperor's Shield, something that made him almost all but impervious to certain small arms, and indeed anything up to strength 8 like overcharged plasma, as they'd be wounding him on a 6. That really is a massive blow to his durability, 
I sort of feel like maybe they should have kept it as just a minus one to wound against things that are greater than his toughness, as you get on plenty of other data sheets out there. Would have made him just a bit more resilient to dedicated anti-tank fire, while not just completely making small arms entirely meaningless shooting him. Otherwise though, he does have plenty of advantages, as he'd hope for a Primarch. He gets Deep Strike to represent his forest walking. He could be an interesting enough choice for a massive or rapid ingress threat, I guess. He has fights first, so the enemy has to be seriously careful about charging him, as they're going to be taking his massive melee damage profile first. His Emperor's Shield in close combat allows him to reflect some saving throws of 6 to get mortal wounds on the enemy, which is kind of fun. And in combat, he strikes with the Armor Luminous for some plasma shots, and then backs that up with 8 attacks at strength 12, AP 4 and damage 4 with lethal hits from Fealty, his massive power sword. The other nerf to his profile comes to Fealty's sweep profile, it's got 16 attacks at strength 6, AP 3 and damage 1 now, previously it was damage 2 and was just a murderous space marine killer. That's going to be a bit more dedicated to anti-horde and you're going to be using the strike profile a fair bit more with the damage 4. It's kind of only relevant against 2 wound things given that against 1 wound stuff he's just as good and against high toughness and higher wound things you'd use the damage 4 profile anyway but it does mean that he's got worse against 1 target. Otherwise with his Primarch command abilities you get to choose one of those 3 boosts in the command phase either a 4 plus save against mortal wounds, a plus 1 to the hit roll for melee units within 6 inches, could be handy to boost nearby deathwing perhaps I guess, and a curious sort of stratagem debuff one that ruins enemy stratagems within 12 inches, they have to take a battle shock test and if they fail it they can't use the stratagem, and your model generates a command point, which could be situationally disruptive, but if they just pass their battle shock test then it's not really going to do anything. Finally, he does get the lone operative keyword when he is nearby 3 inches of Adeptus Astartes infantry. Means that he might often be one of the last models that the opponent can really deal with. And he could pair him with gamey things like the combi weapon lieutenant, which could trigger that while having lone operative itself. Overall, individually, he's still definitely a very threatening model. People might struggle to handle him. Though even before the nerfs to the toughness and his sweep profile, he wasn't run very often competitively. I feel like there's a bit of an element of just one dedicated melee model only being able to do so much in any army. You might get screened or not be able to get into the things that you most need to get into combat with. So even if he does manage to have, say, three turns of smashing important stuff in the fight phase, that might struggle to justify something like an almost 400 point cost. I feel like maybe a points cost of more around the 300 point sort of mark might be a bit more usable for him. He's definitely an enormous threat, but he has taken some big nerfs and is easier to kill after this update. Moving on to the standard Astartes characters though, first up we have Grandmaster Azrael, he was 105 points before, and the chapter master of the Dark Angels has been an absolute competitive staple for the chapter, striking with his Lion's Wrath combi plasma and the Sword of Secrets for some fairly good quality melee damage, and being fairly tanky as characters go, a 2 plus save, 6 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable. What really makes Azrael stand out though is his 3 different buffs that he gets, he gives you sustained hits 1, a nice general purpose damage boost, masterful tactician to farm one command point at the start of each command phase which is just enormous value in its own right, and perhaps one of the most unique buffs for space marines to access is the lion helm, giving models in his unit a 4 plus invulnerable save, pairing really well with anything that just had a regular 3 plus save before. The main change for him in the codex is the list of units that he can lead, and it does seem that he's taken both some wins and some losses here. Looks like he can no longer lead the company heroes, the inner circle companions looking like they're going to be the Dark Angels version of a command squad now, so company heroes are sadly locked out for Azrael. On the other hand though, he has gained access to the vast majority of other standard Tacticus armoured space marines. He can't lead things like Devastators or Desolation squads, though he can lead things like Tactical squads, inner circle companions and Hellblasters. Hellblasters seem like they're a fairly good choice on paper with the invulnerable save, using the sustained hits and farming the CP. I have seen plenty of people just putting him in a cheap squad of intercessors as well. Again, they make pretty good use of his boost for a fairly cheap retinue and can just guard him while he makes CP happen for the first few turns, then maybe venturing out with him to put their melee combat profile to good use. Assault intercessors could have him re-rolling the wound roll as well, potentially. Overall, he is pretty enormous value. If he remains at 105 points for the Dark Angels, I still consider him basically auto-include. Next up we've got the Chief Librarian Ezekiel who was 75 points pre-codex, his datasheet's unchanged and it doesn't look like a new model is coming for him at any time imminently, the datasheet in the codex still lists his current picture miniature, 
whereas the other ones have been updated with, say, the new Asmodai and various others. His profile's pretty much the same, a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable save, so a bit tankier than normal librarians. His psychic power is a potential sniping one called Mind Wipe. Anti character 4 plus and devastating wounds means that he could have d6 damage punched through, and that is a legitimate threat to characters if he got close. And then in combat, he strikes with his Traitor's Bane Force weapon, which gets anti chaos 2 plus. Otherwise, he gives his squad a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks, which is alright. Hands out a Battleshock test to 18 inches, which is a bit mediocre given current Battleshock rules, though I'd rate his single best rule as the Book of Salvation. While he's leading a unit, you get to add plus one to the attack characteristic of that. And now he's actually gained some meaning for melee units to lead. He can lead the Blade Guard veterans and the Inner Circle companions, both of which would profit from that rule. Overall, he honestly does look a bit more playable, having actual meaningful melee units to lead. Again, depending on final points cost, he could be interesting, both providing a damage boost and a bit of psychic shenanigans. Next up, we've got new Asmodai who is getting a fun new miniature, the one with the Crozius and Power Sword and the Incense Trails. Out of any of the datasheets in the Codex, along with the Deathwing Knights, he looks like he's one of the most updated. He's getting the options to lead a whole bunch of different units, kind of similar to Ezekiel. He can lead Blade Guard veterans and Inner Circle companions. Plus the fact that him and Ezekiel can lead all the other more generic Tacticus arm things could be kind of interesting in the Inner Circle detachment, as both of those could give them the Deathwing keyword, which could be fairly big. Asmodai is a 4 wound chaplain with a 3 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. It gives his unit a leadership 5 plus, and its main damage boost is to allow the squad to re roll the hit rolls in melee. Quite a good damage boost, though it will be competing against things like standard lieutenants or the normal chaplain 4 plus 1 to wound, both of which might be a bit more relevant on things like blade guard or inner circle companions. The re roll hits definitely is good, but I guess the problem with both of those is that they both have other things that might buff their hit roll. The Inner Circle Companions might be hitting on twos if they're against characters, and the Blade Guard get their own unique special rule, allowing them to re-roll ones innately if they choose that over the defense boost. Just means that even though he can lead more interesting things in combat now, his damage boost might not be quite as worth it compared with the things that allow them to punch up against tougher targets a bit better. Otherwise though, his own personal damage has been improved a bit. He's got a heavy bolt pistol rather than a regular one for a bit more range and extra AP. And his melee profile has folded in the Blades of Reason into just a more powerful general attack. Previously he had some extra strength for AP0 attacks, but now he just gets a choice of two different profiles with that Crozius and Power weapon. Either 5 attacks at strength 6, AP2 and damage 2, an improvement of 1 AP on the previous strike mode there. Or he gets to hit with a big 8 attacks at strength 5, AP2 and damage 1. He can be quite blendy against hordes if he needs to be. Finally in the fight phase he can hand out Battleshock tests to nearby characters. Could be okay for preventing some CP, but own turn Battleshock tends to be a bit mediocre. Plus, if he actually manages to kill any character models, he generates your CP himself. That's alright, but a bit irrelevant if Azrael happens to be in the army. His points cost pre-codex was 70 points, though it seems that the printed codex cost actually has him go down to 65, which could be interesting. Overall, between his improved melee profile and being able to lead some more meaningful combat squads, I feel like it could be interesting if he has indeed gone down when the digital points come out. I feel like it would be nice to have an excuse to put that fun new model on the table. I'm still not entirely convinced he's going to be optimal to lead the melee units though. Azrael feels like he might be a better choice for inner circle companions, and chaplains or lieutenants might give you competition for leading blade guard. Next up, Master Lazarus was 70 points pre-codex. He gained the Deathwing keyword and a few other options of squads to lead. He's got the profile of a fairly standard Space Marine Captain, 5 wounds with a 3 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable save, and he strikes in melee with Emnity's Edge, 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 3 and damage 2, and that one has the anti psyche 2 plus keyword, so extra nice at killing enemy witches. The special rules that he gives to his unit are a 3 plus feel no pain type save against psyche attacks and mortal wounds, so quite nice for big tough units with high saves. Otherwise he gives his unit a fights on death on a 4 plus special rule if the models in the unit are slain before they get to attack. He can lead a fair few more squads than he could before including tactical squads, inner circle companions and blade guard and things. Though I must admit, I felt like Lazarus's rules could have used a bit of a tune-up come the Codex. For me, none of this really competes against just the standard melee might and the free stratagems of a standard company master or captain. Both of his rules are somewhat situational and might just not come up whatsoever in some games. 
And while his melee isn't bad, it's not like it's particularly standout either. Overall, I feel like he'd have to cost significantly less than a standard captain for me to want to take him compared with one of them, never mind the other fairly good Dark Angel special characters, particularly Azrael. Finally, we've got the Grandmasters of the Deathwing and the Ravenwing. Belial got his new miniature with the Codex. Pre-Codex, the Master of the Deathwing cost 85 points, though it doesn't look like he's had much of a unit profile change to go with that. He's still pretty similar to how he was before. A 6 wound Terminator character with a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. A Mastercrafted Stormbolter with precision with strength 4 and damage 2. And in melee, he strikes with a Sword of Silence. 6 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, also with precision for laying low enemy champions and things. As if that weren't quite precise enough for you, his Grandmaster of the Deathwing rule also grants critical hits become precision hits for a Deathwing unit. And if he was leading a big scary unit, then that could be genuinely quite threatening, both with Storm Bolter and Cyclone Missile Launcher Fire, never mind any Power Fist and things in melee. And then when he does get attacked himself, he gets Strikes of Retribution. Each time a melee attack is allocated to him, he gets to roll a d6. For each 4 plus that you roll, the enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. That one has been nerfed since pre-Codex. They used to go off on a 2 plus, and in all honesty, I did think was perhaps kind of ridiculous for that. It meant that literally if anything attacked him in close combat, they'd be getting around about 5 mortal wounds back. Now it looks like that's dropped to around about 3, which is still something. And the opponent's still going to have to pay for slaying Belial in melee. Overall, I'm still not sure I'm massively convinced on him compared with the other Terminator characters that you might have. I just feel like you're going to get more out of the Terminator Captain's free stratagems, the Librarian's sustained hits, or the Chaplain's plus one to wound. I think that Belial's problem is that he's just a bit too into his precision attacks, which certainly are meaningful in some games where you might be able to snipe important characters out of units, but in other games just aren't going to be relevant. You might just be wiping out entire units wholesale, never mind if they've got characters in them or not. Or they might just not have any units that are meaningful to target with precision. Say for example Imperial or Chaos Knights. There's plenty of other army lists where you might not be able to threaten to kill the enemy characters reliably. Either because they're too tough or too hidden. Finally we have Grandmaster Samael of the Ravenwing. The leader of the second company comes mounted on his jet bike Corvex. 12 inch movement, toughness 5, a 3 plus save. 7 wounds with his 4 plus invulnerable save. He comes with a Mastercrafted Plasma Cannon and a Twin Storm Bolter, so packs a bit of a punch at range, and attacks with a Raven Sword in close combat. Six attacks with sustained hits too. He's fairly good at killing Space Marines. For his boost, his Grandmaster of the Raven Wing special rule means that the unit that he is leading gets to shoot and declare a charge in a turn which it advanced, which does have a little bit of overlap with the core Raven Wing detachment rule though he will make for a fairly scary melee damage dealing unit that could have some good synergy with some of the other options like the stratagems. He can lead either the Outrider squads or the Ravenwing Black Knights, though can no longer lead the Ravenwing Command Squad given that they're sort of a character choice that attaches in their own right now. And as best I can tell, it doesn't look like you can both include Samael and the Ravenwing Command Squad in the same unit, even though it sort of kind of makes sense in the lore in my opinion. I sort of would have expected him to be fighting alongside his Command Squad, it does mean that if some ails in the unit, you wouldn't be able to get an enhancement in the unit, which I suppose is a bit of a downside. Otherwise, his other special rule is called Cut Off Their Escape. If he happens to get a unit with an engagement range, then besides monsters and vehicles, then they have to test Desperate Escape when they fall back, potentially meaning that if they want to fall back from this guy, you're going to be losing a third of your unit, and they get a further debuff to that role if they're battle shocked. That is kind of meaningful, I think. Means that you could potentially have him and his Ravenwing Black Knights charge in and destroy an enemy unit, then consolidate into something else that really doesn't want to be in combat, and then give the opponent tricky decisions as to whether or not they leave them there to get mauled by more power weapon attacks, or fall back and take immediate casualties. Overall, I think his data sheet's okay. He might have a little bit more interest now that Ravenwing have far better support. I think he definitely is going to be competing against the Ravenwing Command Squad though, which if they do remain a similar sort of points cost to him, might have the advantage perhaps. Between the three of them, they do offer more damage between their Plasma Talons and their three melee profiles, bring 12 wounds to the table, and I'd say arguably add more to the squad, particularly given that they can take enhancements and the Master of the Ravenwing can't. Still though, advance and charge is quite big, as is the Desperate Escape thing. Still feels like there is room for Samael if you want to play him. In any case, with characters talked about, that brings us to the end of Codex Dark Angels for Warhammer 40k 10th edition. As mentioned, certainly a codex that perhaps hasn't received the best reaction out there, to put it mildly. 
And I can certainly understand the opinions for that, for where people are coming from. It just is a bit rubbish to look at a whole bunch of data sheets and just see kind of random scattergun nerfs through a bunch of them. On top of a few fairly iconic units being lost, plus the new data sheet for the rather lovely Inner Circle companions not hitting quite as hard in melee as most people would have guessed. I feel like the main strengths of the index are any draws that people might have to the Raven Wing or Death Wing detachments. I feel like both of those could be playable, though will be very heavily reliant on the points cost of just a few units to see them through. They would need their Raven Wing and Death Wing keyworded stuff to be outright strong and be good enough to actually carry the detachment versus taking other things like scary tanks and dreadnoughts and other mainline damage dealers. Otherwise, for the data sheets, highlights seem to be the Raven Wing Command Squad. That looks like a very interesting option now. Asriel still seems rather excellent, and Ezekiel and Asmodai both got a lot better with unit attachments and rules both in their own right, and they were two data sheets that really needed help. Otherwise, for the data sheet nerfs, things like the changes to the Lion and the Deathwing Knights do feel disappointing. I'd hope that Games Workshop might be able to make them still feel good and exciting to play in game, though, with lower points costs. Maybe Deathwing Knights not so very dissimilar from standard Terminators. I still feel that they'd probably command a points premium given that amazing minus one damage rule that they have. And Lionel Johnson is definitely still a melee beast, though nowhere near as hard to kill him as he was before. I think he'd still feel mighty for the points cost if he was priced more like 300 or so. Maybe a little bit disappointing on a few of the character data sheets that felt like they needed rules changes. Belial and Lazarus just don't feel like they'll be adding tons to their units Unless Games Workshop really does point them at a bit of a discount compared with other characters out there. And I felt like the nerf to the Land Speed of Vengeance was somewhat unwarranted. It wasn't exactly a unit that people were going out to spam or anything. In any case, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I'll certainly be following this up with a few more Dark Angels reviews, talking over a couple more units from the Codex in a bit more detail. And I'll be looking forward to covering the official Codex download points once we get them. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics. I do tend to cover new 40k videos just about every day, and I will cover Games Workshop's news, updates, and codex releases. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that down in the video description down below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.